Well, I'm going to share with you a scripture uh, from a well-known interaction that Jesus had in the Gospel of John with the woman at the well. And I uh, believe uh, we'll be able to draw from this uh, a little bit later in the message. Uh, but I'm going to actually invite you, John chapter 4, I'm going to start, I'm going to read selected verses here, but I'm going to start down at verse 23. Of course, um, this is a very familiar passage, and many of you will uh, know it and recall it, but um, the, the passage uh, starts with Jesus uh, going uh, through the borderland of Samaria and a Jew to go into Samaria, and then he engages with a woman, and of course, that was quite uh, taboo in the culture, uh, and so he's engaging with uh, one that uh, typically a man would not engage with being a woman, but then also furthermore is the fact that she's a Samaritan woman, uh, and there was quite animosity between the Jews and the Samaritans. Uh, so uh, I wanted to uh, share with you and pick this up starting at verse 23. This is well into their conversation when she was trying to skirt some of the issues that Jesus was getting down to business in her life and actually pointing out her sin, uh, which is a little uncomfortable if you've ever had anybody do that to you. I can attest uh, to that from personal example. But would you pick up the reading with me, John 4, verse 23. Uh, she said, you worship... Uh, uh, what you do not know. We worship what we know. This is Jesus. Uh, you worship what you do not know, but we worship what we uh, do know, for salvation is, is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. Did you catch that? The Father is seeking such worshipers to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ, and when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who am speaking to you am he. May God bless the hearing of his word. What a powerful interaction where Jesus fully revealed to this woman who he was, both uh, by what he knew about her and her past lifestyle of being with five men, because he called her out and asked her to bring her husband, of course, knowing full well that the man that she currently was engaged with or living with or, uh, or cohabitating with was not her husband. And she had previous relationships. And so, therefore, in the standard, she was a defiled woman, a woman of the city, a sinful woman. And he was calling her out and pointing out her sin and addressing that with her. It's a bit confrontational. Usually we think of Jesus welcoming the little children, and we have images from Sunday school of Jesus uh, you know, lovingly having the, the kids gathered around and being this kind Jesus. But we sometimes forget the Jesus who was in the temple with the whip turning over the money tables of the money changers and cracking the whip and chasing them out of there uh, because he had fervor for the house of God and said this should be called a house of prayer. In the same way here, you see, Jesus, he is full of love and compassion and grace and mercy, but there's also another side. He also loves us so much not to leave us dead in our sins and transgressions. He wants to confront that and address that and that's really about the gospel, isn't it? So uh, the reason I bring this, this passage up to you is because it's directly related to missions. You see, we see Jesus on mission with this woman, doing a missional engagement, taking the gospel in word and deed into this woman's life and sharing it. So uh, I've got the uh, passage here up on the screen. This is our conference theme verse, Luke uh, chapter 8, verse 1. Can you read it with me? Soon afterward, he went on through the cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God, and the 12 were with him. This passage uh, is really uh, helpful for you to understand what the Global Ministries team was thinking about when we came up with this theme of the gospel to the nations, that we would be found faithful, and this is our key conference verse because it shares all that we hope gets done both through our missionaries out on the field but also in our uh, very own lives here in Birmingham that we would uh, 
model uh, everything we do on the Word of God and what Jesus himself did. And here you have a great example of Christ, what he did, going throughout the cities and villages, proclaiming with his mouth, and also bringing with his deeds, the gospel deeds, of the good news of the kingdom of God. You see both happening. And the 12 were right there with him. Everything that he did, they observed, they saw. And Jesus is very intentional in his leadership. He did it for a purpose. He, he took the opportunity to practice and to demonstrate what they would uh, be accountable for and what they would be asked to do upon his uh, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension into, the, into heaven when he gave the Great Commission. This was gonna be a task that they would fulfill through the power of the Holy Spirit, taking the word of Christ and the power of Jesus, the resurrected Jesus through his spirit and to go out to all nations. So Jesus was modeling this behavior of what he would one day pass on to them. So I find it helpful and this was uh, really useful when I came to Christ and was discipled in high school. My discipler, uh, really challenged me to uh, be curious when it comes to the Word of God. So when you read a passage, uh, the man who discipled me always challenged me to come to the Word of God with a curiosity, with a hunger, with a love for the Word of God, and really to ask questions of the Scripture and of God when I was reading uh, the Scripture. And so uh, he kind of discipled me this way, and it's actually proven to be a really uh, a great strategy throughout the rest of my Christian walk and especially in ministry that I would always be curious uh, when I'm reading a passage of scripture. And so he kind of set this model for me. It's a threefold model. One is to pray before reading the scripture, then to read the scripture, and then to ask questions of God, and then to pray again. The fourth step is that prayer that God would illuminate the very word of God that I've just read. So first of all, to pray means I come to God believing that God's word is true. I come to God's word believing it's true and that God has a word for me and God uh, put the word of God together in such a way that as I read that, there's gonna be something useful in it for my life. And so I trust him and I pray and ask, Lord, what would you uh, share with me in this passage? And so uh, coming to, to the scripture with curi uh, curious questions and engagement and prayer is a great strategy uh, in your life. I know many of you have found this faith, uh, faithful uh, pattern for your own devotional life. So what kind of questions can you ask God in his word? All kinds. Lots of different questions when you come to God. Lord, why is that verse there? Or Lord, why is that person engaging in that way? All these are very meaningful questions for you to ponder in your heart and to seek the Lord and to study his word and search other scriptures to cross-reference and kind of get an answer from the Lord and ask his spirit to illuminate. The spirit of God loves to illuminate the word of God. And we have promises in the word of God that says his word will not return a void, that it will accomplish the purpose that he intends for it to accomplish in your life and in my life, because it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And it's going, to, uh, it's going to accomplish its purpose. So it's several questions that I ask of this uh, passage uh, from our key theme verses. Who? Y'all know these, right? What? When? Where? And why? These are great five, five great questions that, to ask, but you can ask any other questions of God's word and seek him in those questions as well. But uh, be curious when you come to God's word. So I'm gonna kind of go through and uh, just examine uh, some of the passage in our theme verse in uh, Luke chapter eight. And I'm gonna apply some of these questions to it and I'm gonna invite you along this journey with me. So who is mentioned in this passage of Luke eight? Well, Jesus certainly is. Soon afterward, he, that refers to Jesus, he went through the cities and villages. So who is it? And you skip a little bit further down and it says, and the 12 were with him also. And I'm actually gonna read a little bit more in that passage because uh, it's hard to fit a conference theme verse when you have four or five verses onto a nice banner like we have in the back of the, uh, the room. You have, to, uh, you have to pick and choose wisely because they the whole passage won't fit on the, the banner. But let me read to you the end here of that Luke verse, uh, chapter eight, verse one. Soon afterward, 
he went on through the cities and villages proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the 12 were with him. And also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. These were like uh, Jesus's uh, faithful, sacrificial women who funded his public ministry were with them. And you notice that the ministry uh, people who were funding them had come from people who had been converted by Christ, by his powerful word and by his testimony, and by him sharing, just like we read earlier about the, the women at the well. Those who had been converted and had their lives powerfully touched by Christ and his ministry, some had demons uh, removed from them, some had been healed of diseases. Um, and because of his powerful ministry of preaching and bringing gospel deeds together into their lives, now they were following along, observing what he did, watching him model the ministry of the Father in this world. And they were generously, sacrificially giving their faith promise uh, investment for the ministry of Jesus. Can you imagine getting the opportunity to invest in the ministry of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? That's exactly what you get the opportunity to do with our faith promise. And those women who had been healed and ministered to, they were investing their faith promise offering into the very ministry of Jesus Christ. What an incredible blessing. So what did he do? So we looked at the who, now what? What did Jesus do? Well, if you look at uh, kind of the immediately two or three chapters preceding the very beginning of, of chapter eight, we see a lot of what Jesus was doing. You see, because Jesus was intentional and he was active, he wasn't sitting back. Jesus was actively engaged in ministry because he had a purpose and he had a plan and he was doing the ministry powerfully, prayerfully, Many of these times it says that he uh, retreated to a desolate place, went up onto a mountain and prayed all night long. Jesus was super intentional with how he spent his time and who he invested in. It's really challenging when you think about our lives and how uh, we invest our time. May God uh, continue to use Jesus as an example in our lives that we would evaluate the way we spend our time and how we spend our time and who we spend our time with. But let's just look at what he did in the, in the uh, chapters leading up to uh, chapter eight. So what did he do? Well, for one, he taught in their synagogues. He taught on the hillsides. In fact, he taught the Beatitudes are listed there. He taught from a boat. He proclaimed the good news to the poor. He healed the infirmities of people. He healed the blind. He set at liberty those who were oppressed. He healed a man fully covered in leprosy. He healed a paralyzed man. He healed a man with a withered hand. He healed the servant of the centurion. He raised the widow of Nain. Her dead son was in the funeral uh, bier as they were parading it through and he touched it and healed and raised a dead child back to life and returned the, the son to his mother. He literally brought someone back from the grave, back to life. Also, he dined in a Pharisee's house. He allowed a sinful woman, not only to be in the same home with him, but to actually touch him as she broke that alabaster flask and spread the perfume all in her hair and on his feet and covered his feet with kisses and tears as she loved much because she had been forgiven much. What a joy that Jesus had. There's a lot that he did and a lot more was not even recorded for us in scripture of all that he had taught and did. But we see very specifically what God wanted in his word for us to see. These are the deeds of Jesus. You notice in there, it's both word and deed. He did ministry in people's lives and set them free. And he also forgave their sins and provided healing spiritually. 
So where did he go? It's clear in that passage that he went through the cities and the villages. Several of those cities listed are Galilee, Nazareth, Capernaum, Simon's house. He went to a desolate place, as I shared. He was, went on the Sea of Galilee. He went to Nain. He walked in grain fields. These are all in the preceding chapters of uh, Luke chapter 8. So I want to point out a couple things about where he went. Please notice uh, with me, where did he go? Well, he went to the cities and the villages. He wasn't exclusive. He went to both sides of town, across the tracks, if you will. Jesus didn't just stay in the nicer areas. He also went in uh, the remote rural areas. He traveled on the, on the roads, on the waysides, out into the villages, but he certainly spent a lot of time in the cities and in the synagogues as well. Just examine and where Jesus went he didn't exclude anyone, whether you're country folk or whether you're city uh, slicker, an urban dweller. Christ's message is for all of us. Nobody is too high for it and nobody is too low for it, no matter what background you come from. The gospel, there's a great level of field at the, at the foot of the cross and Christ goes to all places. And through our missionaries, our missionary endeavor is to go to all places not just exclusively to one over the other to show some kind of preference or favoritism. That's not the way of the gospel and that's not the way of Jesus. To take the gospel to all the world, to all ethnic uh, tribes and tongues and nation, that we shouldn't be exclusive toward one or the other. Of course, you see that modeled when he ministered to the woman at the well because he crossed certain boundaries there that many uh, dared not cross. In Luke uh, chapter 7, just before our conference theme verse, uh, there was a, a group of men that were dispatched from John the Baptist's ministry, and John sent them with a very specific question in Luke uh, 7, 20 to 23. He said this, and when the men had come to them, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you saying, are you the one who is to come or should we look for another? In that hour, Jesus healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits. And on many were blind, they, re they received their sight back. And he answered them to go and tell John what you have seen and what you have heard. The blind receive their sight, the poor have the good news preached to them. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. You see, this is a clear cut way that Jesus was saying yes, I am he. Tell John, yes, tell him what the scripture says about me. He will recognize me by, by my deeds, by what I do and by what I say, by the good news preached and proclaimed and the gospel deeds of love and mercy as I touch people's lives and bring sinners home through healing them and through prayer and through ministry, through casting out demons, through bringing back a, a, a son who has been dead back to his mother. These are the gospel deeds that Jesus did. And I already mentioned that the 12 were with him and that he was modeling this ministry to them. And this is an important point that I don't want you to miss because Jesus modeled this to the disciples that they would take the ministry of Jesus and continue on, which of course has been passed on all the way to us. And in fact, if you examine the high priestly prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17, he even prays for those who would believe in him through the ministry of the disciples. That includes us here tonight. If you're a Christian and you have uh, had somebody share the gospel with you and you have prayed to receive Christ and God's spirit has opened your heart and turned uh, turn your heart uh, by the grace of God and given you conversion, that includes you, that Jesus has prayed for you and it says that he ever lives to intercede for his children. You see, this is an amazing part of the mission of Christ that he modeled it, but even before that, if you look at John 20, 21, Jesus was obeying his father. He wasn't just doing this ministry uh, to model it to his disciples. He was actually obeying his father when Jesus uh, said, uh, just as the father has sent me, so I send you. So Jesus obeyed the father and was sent by him to do all these things that I shared about, but also then he was sending them. 
and today that's our very mission that's why we have a missions conference that's why we've turned aside for these for these seven days or 14 days if you count last weekend of focus intentionally uh, on all the ministry that God has called us to this is what Christ wants us to do in mission to bring the word and the deed to go to the cities and the villages to not neglect anyone to go to all nations. After all, this is the very purpose for which he came. Jesus' engagement with Nicodemus, he said, marvel not, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Jesus constantly confronted sinners with their sin and pointed out their desperate need of Christ. This is the good news, the hope of the gospel, that we would be set free from our sin. One of the challenges that we see in uh, modern ministry is that some uh, sometimes churches and mission agencies and others they get off track pastor reader's been preaching about it that we have to stay on message in ministry we got to keep being focused and keep being anchored in the word of god because we have a tendency to drift and some ministries uh, will start tending toward liberalism and they'll start just doing the good deeds alone of, of feeding and giving water and caring for those who are homeless and doing these things and that is wonderful but if you neglect the pro proclamation of the word of God, you're not helping anyone spiritually at all. And Jesus always did both, gospel deed proclaimed from his mouth and gospel deed and love and mercy together, always combined together. Let Briarwood and all of our ministries constantly stay focused on this. We encourage our uh, missionaries regularly with this challenge. I'd like to just share a photo with you uh, up on the screen. This is a story, this is a picture of my son when we were, he was quite young. And uh, I had the opportunity to be working on a project at my home. And in this project, I was building a major uh, carport area with uh, my chainsaw and those big railroad cross ties and cutting them up so that I could have an area to park my car. But what was right behind this wall, this big retaining wall that I was building, was a, a area where I was gonna backfill with dirt and then put a swing set up for, the, for my children and also a big sandbox and they were gonna have a new place to play in and things. Well, my, my children had no idea what the master plan was that uh, I was doing. But you can see uh, by looking at him at two years old, he strapped on the goggles and grabbed both hammers. I think one's a rubber mallet and a hammer. And he saw daddy out there working with the chainsaw and the cross uh, ties and digging in the dirt with the shovels. And he just wanted to come alongside and enter into my work with me. He had no idea what the plan was. He didn't know how it was gonna come out. He didn't know the result. He didn't know that there was a swing set at the end of this project for him. He had no idea, I didn't share that with him. I'm the father, I was just doing my work. And he wanted to enter into to that work. I share this picture with you and this story to kind of have this childlike heart as Briarwood, that we would have the, the heart of a child that would simply want to join the father in his work with joy and sweetness and gladness. Pastor Reeder shared this morning in his sermon that, uh, that conversion is a specific event, but evangelism is a multiple stage process that God uses many people uh, in that process, and he certainly has in my life, used many people along the way to share deposits of God's word and minister to me along the way. That's often the way God works powerfully in our lives as he uh, has people do evangelism along the way in our lives. Some water, some plant, some uh, continue to feed, and some cultivate the soil even before the planting happens. And then some, they have the joy in actually seeing the harvest come and they see the fruit of it where that life comes to Christ and there's a conversion through God's mighty power. A life is changed and a new heart is placed in that soul. That's a powerful moment. But the thing is, no matter whether you were the one who cultivated the soil in somebody's life or whether you were sowing the seed or whether you watered it or whether you were the, the one who harvested, all rejoice together when that one comes to Christ. So thankful to hear the stories that Taylor shared about the scripture and lives coming to Christ or our dear sister Choco is playing the piano and her coming to Christ. All of heaven rejoices when one sinner comes to repentance. We praise the Lord for that. So in closing, I wanna encourage you 
to be like our missionaries who are entering into the joy of their loving Heavenly Father, doing their own little part, just like my son with the goggles and the hammer. We don't all know exactly the, what the plan is or how God's working in somebody's life, but be faithful to do your part, to share this message. We have a glorious message through Christ. He has touched our lives. He has redeemed us. Don't keep it a secret. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a bushel basket. It doesn't make sense. You light a lamp and you hold it up high. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. We wanna let it shine and all people see Christ in your life through your verbal proclamation, declaring your testimony and ministering to God. You heard testimonies all week long from Siguatepeque, Honduras, to the Ikea in Norway of people taking a faith risk to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was a powerful week, wasn't it? May each one of us be swept up into this grand mission of Christ in such a way that everything else is counted as rubbish, that we would see uh, the name of Christ magnified and glorified, and we would see one day heaven populated by those that we've ministered to and served in the name of Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you for the ministry of Jesus. Thank you for allowing us to enter in. Oh, Lord God, we're so grateful for the work that you're doing in our lives. Continue to bless our missionaries all across the world. Father, thank you for this week. In Jesus' name, amen.